And your mic is live. You are fully live. Okay. Awesome. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sheridan Rathbun. Uh, I'm the creator of Barony, and uh, this is kind of like a, an informal post-mortem thing. So uh, let me just get started. I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, kind of for me, this, this presentation is kind of going to be in like three parts. First of it is just going to be kind of a very brief uh, history of who I am. And it's not going to be like a whole life story. It'll be very abrupt or short. Uh, so I won't uh, uh, waste too much of your time with that. Second part, I'll get into some of the technical stuff. And third part, um, I'll just kind of go over um, the, uh, kind of a short story of um, the culmination of everything that's happened over the past uh, few months. So uh, I've been playing uh, games for pretty much my entire life. Um, I started making games when I was seven years old. Uh, this book that's pictured here um, is a cover of the book that uh, my dad bought for my older brother um, one Christmas. And uh, he kind of thumbed through that book. and. Uh, uh, installed uh, all of the software on the CD in the back because it was one of those books, you know, with a uh, mm -hmm. included CD, and uh, uh, he installed all of the software there. Kind of played around with it, tinkered it, didn't really get into it, and I got to it, and my mind was just blown because to me, it's like I hadn't even considered that you could make games at all to begin with. Like I was just a kid, you know, and I had spent all of my time playing games because it's like I. I wasn't, you know, the social type to go out and make friends or whatever, so I just sat home and played games. So this thing was like, this is amazing. And uh, I started making games, uh, and that's all I did, really, is I played games and I made games uh, until I was 12 years old, picked up C programming, spent all of high school pretty much doing the same, and uh, I got more and more um, uh, into the... Uh, uh, development side of things, and I learned more and more uh, advanced math and just picked up all of these skills. Uh, pictured on the left is a uh, screenshot from a, uh, an advanced kind of Raycaster project uh, that I made when I was 16. Um, on the right is a simple side scrolling prototype thing that I made uh, a little bit later. I was playing around with some game design concepts. But uh, by the time I had graduated high school, I uh, did not have like any general idea for what I wanted to do with myself. I had, you know, spent my entire life learning to make games, but uh, and I had made you know hundreds of you know, tech demos or games, you could say, to various stages of completion. But I had never really made any big project. And uh, over high school, I had honestly lost some confidence, you know, whether I could ever actually, um, you know do that. Uh, so that's why I had honestly uh, spent all that time just developing the skills because I couldn't do anything else. Um, so I got pretty good at it. And so by the time I graduated, I felt, yeah, I, I could make a game if I wanted to. Now I just need the idea. Um, of course, you know, it being the end of high school and everything, my parents were kind of encouraging me to enroll in college. Um, so uh, I was just like, OK. And, Nothing better to do. So I go to college, and I hated it there. Because for the first year, it was like, OK, um, I was put in this environment where you know you start talking to other people and everything, and um, kind of encouraged more to go out of your uh, comfort zone socially and everything. And I found that everybody I met, like all of my peers and everything, um, uh, I was like kind of on a different wavelength where um, like at the time I enrolled in like fall of 2012 and it's like the Avengers had come out just the previous summer and it's like so everybody's talking about the Avengers and it's like I haven't even seen that movie it's like what the fuck is the Avengers can we talk about Raycasters maybe <laughs> anybody so yeah um, you know I yeah yeah thank you um, uh, but yeah, uh, I, you know, I, and I tried, you know, um, reaching out to other people, you know, getting into the clubs and um, talking to, you know, other CS students and everything, because that was my major. 
And uh, even, even there, it's like there was nobody who really um, had that um, drive, I guess, to do anything creative. It's like they were all there, you know, and we're all just kind of in this soup. And there was nothing driving anybody to create anything. There, there were, you know, isolated kind of satellites or pockets of e extreme talent. You know, I, I met lots of really uh, skilled people and stuff, but none of them were, you know, working together on anything major. So uh, uh, the following summer, I uh, resolved I have to make something because um, I can't live my entire life um, kind of on the fringe where I have all of the skill, but I've done nothing with it. So, uh, and, and nobody else is going to like push me, you know, out there to do this. So, uh, I was playing games with my younger brother. Uh, a lot of them are listed there, and uh, I'd I'd been playing some of these games my entire life. Others I had been playing recently, particularly uh, Spelunky and Baldur's Gate, Dark Alliance, and uh, I was always playing them with my brother. He was like, you know, my, uh, I, I guess, my, uh, my pylon or beacon, you know, hold on the, the rest of the world. And uh, um, I, I played these games with him, and particularly it, it came to a point, I, I had been prototyping a few different game ideas um, in early June and nothing had really come up yet, but I was still really, really determined to make something. And uh, we were playing Baldur's Gate, and for the record, this particular entry in Baldur's Gate, I hated it. Uh, th there was just so much wrong with the design and everything. Um, and I, I was sitting there playing it, even still, with my brother, and I was like, you know, what if I could make a game that it's like, and it, it just all kind of blew up in my head. It was like, what if there were a game that was kind of like a 3D net hack with multiplayer? I had thought of like just the 3D net hack part before, because I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody's kind of had ideas about doing something like that. I mean, obviously there's Delver out now, um, which is inspired less by net hack, more Ultima Underworld, but um, uh, I, I had had that idea before, but the multiplayer thing, um, was inspired by playing with my brother. And uh, so I was like, that, that's what all of these games are missing, really, these roguelike games and these dungeon crawlers, is that you play by yourself. And sometimes you even feel like, man, it would be great you know, to have you know, my buddy here and we're you know, playing together. But there was no game out there really like this. So I was like, well, that's it. You know, this is what I'm going to do. And the same night, I just dove right in. And uh, so began year one of development right then and there. Um, first thing I did is uh, plunged into development of the game engine. Um, the entire game and the game engine was written in C. Um, we used SDL uh, for the back end, and originally the renderer was software based. It was, again, just a raycaster. And one important point um, that uh, I feel like just pointing out, is that um, the uh, world structure that we designed was deliberately simple, as in it, it, it's just a two-dimensional array, squares, 2D floor plan, and uh, nothing complicated. And that was by design. I had made more complicated game engines than that, but I wanted something simple specifically because I wanted to capture the uh, dungeon crawling experience of roguelikes like NetHack, which, again, have a flat floor plan, two-dimensional square rooms and everything. And um, this was really important to me because I felt if you spend too much time deliberating and working on a game engine that allows you all of the facilities that most other game engines give you, you know, the uh, complex world designs and, you know, the sprawling vistas and all of the whatever you have imagined. Um, and you spend all of your time developing that, then inevitably all of this effort goes into 
re-implementing all of the tropes that you see in every other video game in you know, the world. And uh, I didn't want that. So uh, we deliberately picked a very simple design that was um, envisioned simply to take a basic roguelike and put you in the driver's seat, you know, so you can see it in first person. And um, uh, we made the choice to make it real time uh, beca simply because uh, the game was going to be multiplayer. And um, we decided it would be more fun to play a real time kind of roguelike game in multiplayer than it would be to take turns or figure out some other crazy, you know, dynamic to work by. So, uh, we, uh, or I really, it, it was just me for the first few months, I uh, planned all of this out just immediately and uh, uh, got right to work on it. Uh, we made it cross-platform because personally I've always been platform agnostic. I don't care whether you use Windows, Linux, Mac, it's all cool to me. Um, C is portable if you know how to use it right. And uh, if, yes, very big if. And uh, so uh, from the beginning, and we uh, supported Windows, Linux, and uh, Plan Mac. At the time, didn't have a Mac, but uh, we had come that far. So uh, we just kind of threw it in there. Um, uh, oh, and but I'll mention this now. The uh, screenshot on the right, that, that is from a very early alpha. Um, at that time, we already had uh, the lighting in there. Uh, the lighting um, is very uh, simple, but flexible. Uh, basically, it's a, a light map where um, every uh, tile in the game has a light value ranging from 0 to you know, 255. And um, the uh, light values of every uh, cell are, ca are calculated every time a new light object is spawned somewhere. So basically, you can spawn a light object. And if you want to move it, you simply uh, remove it and then spawn it someplace else. And this actually worked very, very well because the world format was so simple. You can ray trace for every single tile and you know, uh, clip against the walls and everything, and you can get moving lights that even though they're low resolution, you only calculate the light on a per cell basis. You can see it in that screenshot. We didn't have blending between the cells or anything. Even though it's so low resolution and everything, you can have moving lights and it looks um, uh, realistic, um, which is a, another thing. Uh, this is minor tangent, but uh, one of the things that I learned um, from a few different games is that a lot of realism just came simply out of the animation and the motion of things, which is what animation means. It's uh, the process of animating something or bringing it to life. It doesn't matter whether it's made out of blocks or sticks. If you make it run like a person, it looks like a person. So. Um, yeah, we applied that um, completely here, uh, where it, it didn't matter to us you know, whether the game was low res or not. Um, we wanted to make something that just felt really good. So um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip ahead to the art design. The art design was uh, mostly a practical and pragmatic choice. A lot of people look at it. And uh, immediately they think, you know, Minecraft or something like that. For the record, we were not inspired by Minecraft uh, on any level, really. Uh, of course, you know, we've played lots of Minecraft, but it wasn't Minecraft that spurred us to uh, produce the art like this. Really, it was just the recognition that um, we're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of different objects and uh, obstacles and just things you can find in this world. And we can slave over each and every one, but frankly, I'm not an artist, and uh, I wanted to design the game such that if it came down to it, I could make it entirely by myself. This had to be a project that I could make from beginning to end and finish it, 
And uh, even if you know I, I brought people on and they bailed on me or whatever, I could finish this thing entirely by myself. So uh, the art design was simply practical, uh, pragmatic, and uh, it did the trick. So uh, yeah, um, going back to the uh, level editor and the random dungeons, you know, any good roguelike has to have random dungeons and stuff. So. Uh, I developed a random dungeon generator that's kind of a mix, actually, between random dungeons and designed dungeons, where um, what you actually do is you make a set of pre-designed rooms and pieces of a level, a greater level, in the level editor, so you can design you know, your interesting architecture or whatever, and then what it does when you tell it to, for example, generate a swamp level, it loads a big empty swamp area. And then it takes these miniature rooms and pieces from the swamp set and inserts them randomly at various locations that it picks, um, mostly based on whatever space is available left. It keeps uh, intelligent track of uh, what pieces fit in what places and such, such that um, there's no uh, random element in terms of the loading times it'll take to, do, to uh, create a level. Uh, level generation generally takes under a second, um, so there's no great long loading times. Um, even in multiplayer, which we managed to achieve, see, normally we would have had to, say, transfer the entire level data from you know, server to client and such. We managed to cut this down again to uh, under a second by simply having the server transmit to the clients a uh, random seed that uh, they can then use to generate the entire level th again themselves. Uh, this works even across multiple platforms uh, because we uh, um, managed to find a uh, portable random number generator implemented in C. It just uses a basic cipher and um, use that uh, to uh, generate uh, uh, predictable uh, strings of numbers you know, on any given system. So uh, that would be the level editor. Uh, we did make it possible to uh, entirely uh, design large levels. For example, the one pictured on the left is the uh, for floor plan for a level called Mine Town. This is kind of a subterranean community uh, in one of the deeper levels of the dungeon. and. Um, uh, this was done mostly uh, to um, create uh, recognizable kind of staging points for players. So uh, there are also um, pre-designed boss levels and other secret levels that you can find. Uh, uh, finally, the level designer, uh, the level editor tool, that is, um, is... Uh, open to the players, we tried to make it intuitive as possible. And uh, the level generator, in fact, can be um, taken advantage of by players uh, to let them generate their own level sets if they so want to. So um, during this time, uh, I managed to accrue a team of uh, five individuals other than myself to develop this game. Um, of course, you know, this being an indie project and the first of mine, uh, none of it, uh, well, we weren't paid for any of this. And um, we worked on it together for a year until uh, in uh, early 2014, uh, we sought to find funding from Kickstarter. And uh, long story short is this didn't go well for us. Uh, we couldn't get any major publication to feature us because we were kind of like the new kids on the block. We had um, Bopped around Tig Source and uh, such and uh, such, you know, places. We had uh, been briefly featured on PC Gamer, not featured like on the front page, but you know, we made it in their news log somewhere down there. Oh yeah, and then there's Barony. Uh, um, so we appeared there, um, but uh, this short buzz of attention uh, died off really quickly, and uh, we found ourselves. Um, kind of in the middle of nowhere in terms of public awareness. And uh, uh, 
my uh, obligations at school were kind of bearing down and everything. So we attempted this Kickstarter and it failed. And uh, so I didn't know, um, you know, whether we should keep going or not. I kind of had this lapse in confidence where it's like, okay, we've been working on this for a year, but do people actually want this? You know, should I keep going? And uh, deliberated on it, spoke with the team and everything for about a week, and uh, came to the conclusion that, yes, this is worth it to me personally. Even if nobody um, ever sees this, um, I made it for myself and for my brother. And um, I think it's a good game so far. Um, so we decided to keep going. And um, somehow the rest of the team just kind of rallied around that and uh, we continued working. Through the summer, uh, con gradually adding more and more content until uh, uh, the uh, deadline for the Independent Games Festival rolled around. Again, we submitted, uh, failed to be nominated, and uh, um, it was around this time that I dropped out of university because up until this point I had maintained full-time status. It was, it was up to this point that I maintained full-time status, but um, honestly the challenges of running the team and developing the game uh, in combination with maintaining full-time status was just a tremendous amount of work and stress and uh, in particular, it came to a point that uh, shortly before the uh, deadline for the uh, Independent Games Festival, um, uh, the following week, this was the weekend, uh, I, was going, I had several exams due. And uh, I had been crunching on the game all weekend, you know, trying to get some, you know, those cool features done, you know, for the IGF and everything, making lots of progress. And uh, then, uh, you know, it's like, final hour of Sunday, two exams due tomorrow, haven't done any studying, I can either let my GPA tank or I can just throw in the towel and you know dedicate to the uh, game full time. Honestly, I didn't see any future in uh, my degree. Obviously, you know, it's the employment pros uh, prospects and everything are far greater and uh, it, it's far more financially secure if I had taken that route, but um, again, I had spent my entire life up to this point doing nothing but making games, and I couldn't see myself doing anything else in the future. Uh, I, I could never, ever um, see myself just working a, an office job and, you know, for 40 years until I die without ever you know, demonstrating what I had you know, more or less been born to do. So I dropped out of university. Uh, somehow got a girlfriend, and uh, then it was on. Um, okay. uh, yeah, on in more ways than one. Um, then it was crunch mode, and uh, this it really kind of um, is where it gets into the dark period of um, my uh, last year of life, where, um, okay, the first thing that happened is my car broke down. The engine was just totally, totally shot. Um, it was an old beater vehicle, um, a 1997 Dodge Stratus, and it, it was at the end of its lifespan, and it, it died. And uh, I had had savings uh, saved up from the scholarships that I had accumulated. Um, uh, but since dropping out, you know, th this was kind of like, you know, my lifeblood. And uh, um, I ended up spending all of that to uh, repair my car uh, so I could keep going. Uh, the, okay, um, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, it was shortly after this that my girlfriend left me. Uh, we had only been dating for a few months, but uh, frankly, this hit me a lot harder than I ever thought it would. Um, through this time, I didn't have, you know, any social contact with anybody, uh, so losing her was kind of a big blow, because um, even though we hadn't even known each other that long, I felt like um, 
there was, uh, I, I can't explain it. A lot was kind of, yeah, yeah, okay. Right, right. So, so uh, uh, she left me. Um, And it was tough. <laughs> um, finally, uh, by the time release day came around, uh, I was kind of at the end of my rope, uh, just mentally. Um, the, the, uh, the stress was kind of uh, um, uh, taking me out of it a bit, like mentally, I wasn't all there, and um, it, it's 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 honestly a weird feeling when um, you're lying in bed and you're thinking to yourself, "Man, uh, you know, uh, that sounds kind of nice." <laughs> um, I, I'm not defeatist or fatalist in any way. In fact, I generally consider myself an optimist. Um, but um, it, it's, it was real, and it was kind of surreal and uh, weird. I was thinking to myself, um, you know, do, I, I'm not even sure this matters to me anymore. I've, I've spent the last several months doing this, and uh, it hasn't got me anywhere. So, um, but then uh, things kind of turned around for us. Uh, leading up to our release day, uh, we met uh, a fellow named Kevin White, who's uh, the community manager for a game called Unepic on Steam. And uh, uh, that was a huge boost for us because uh, in talking with him, he made it clear, he, he was like, man, this game's golden. You really, really need to do something with this. And he was like, in fact, you know what, I'm, I'm going to you know, rally all of my, uh, my legion of like, uh, Twitch streamers, and we're, we're going to stream this for you. And I was like, wow. You know, so it's like, you know, I had, you know, some hope there. And uh, I met a fellow from the UK named uh, Ryan Hardiman. Um, he uh, got us some deals uh, with a couple sites, uh, Indie Game Stand and uh, Groupies, which I can't really recommend, but <laughs> there it is. Um, and uh, through all of this, the green light campaign, which we had started up earlier in the month, um, kind of blew through the roof, and uh, we just managed to get greenlit. So uh, the game's going to come out in, on Steam uh, June fourth. So, uh, um, yeah. Uh, shortly after, like our self-publication, we had some technical issues with the Mac port, and that took about a month to sort out, and that was kind of uh, challenging and a little. Uh, scary, but uh, we managed to sort that all out, and uh, uh, the whole thing was kind of stressful. Don't look on the past few months very fondly, but, uh, you know, now the game's out there, and, you know, I did it. So. Yeah. We have time for exactly one question. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I made a game. You have to, you have to repeat the question. Okay. The Has uh, anything good ever happened to me? Yes, I made a game. <laughs> good I met all of you. There you go. Oh.